I want to know everything there is to know about you. I am going to introduce me. You must have spotted her by now. She's always there. Don't I deserve love? Somebody has to like me best. Ghosts go about in white sheets and carry chains and go... Ooh, ooh. Now, Anne, why do you make up such stories? I don't. I read them in books. Well, you shouldn't believe everything that you read in books. Hello, and welcome to the Don or Her podcast. I'm Michael. And I'm Fanula. <laughs> you wish, and I wish too. I would love if we did this podcast and had the actual actors come on and be like, why the hell are you talking about me this way? <laughs> And and you specifically want them to replace me, yeah? Well, yeah, I don't want to be replaced. Um... Sure, makes sense. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's actually more practical for how the podcast works. No, God, no, oh, no. I'm on. not replacing anyone. We will have them as guests with us. Um, and if you haven't uh, listened to us before, um, we really should have explained oh, what the hell we were talking about before we went into that spiel. But we're here to celebrate actors who we feel for one way or another they haven't had um, the celebration that they deserve. And we're also in a little bit of a very mini-series for Halloween. So Yay. this is the second of a two-parter. We just talked about Christina Rishi, which was absolutely fun. Had a great guest. Lovely. And now we're back to talk about someone whose presence is like very like... How do, would I best describe it? It feels like it encapsulates time as if like they're incredibly wise, but they've also lived a long time. And I'm talking about when they're young and, you know, up to the present, when they're um, at their later years. And she also has played um, in a film about ghostly spirits, the others. So yes. we are talking about a national icon, a national treasure of Ireland, Fanula Flanagan. Yay, Fanula, in case you didn't get that from my faux intro. And Fanula is someone that we kind of stumbled upon. So we have a very long Tripped list. over her. <laughs> Literally stumbled, stumbled upon her. She was lying on the streets and I tripped over her. <laughs> we were in Dublin having a few drinks and whoa. <laughs> She'd had too was... many. <laughs> we had too many. Are you talking about me? <laughs> no, she was on the street because she'd had too many, but so had oh we. Oh, my Lord. Well, again, as well as doing podcasts with these actors, I'd love to go out drinking with them. Um, so oh, this gosh, is like yeah. tying it all up in a bow. But um, sadly, that's not true. But we do have a long list on some Google Docs somewhere of all the actors we'd love to talk about at some point. Fnula was probably there from the off um, when we I first so. made that list. Um, yeah. But then we were talking about halloween films and people... Um, that we enjoy and films we enjoy and Fanula jumped out at me because I'll always remember her doing an interview on the Irish um, big chat show on a Friday night the Late Late Show and claiming that she had a very good chance of being Oscar nominated for the others and me being my like 15 or uh, whatever year old self thought like yeah like A she deserves it B like it's the right time of her career and C like maybe Nicole Kidman be nominated too like she, it was her year was like Moulin Rouge or the others and I yeah. think it's like how exciting because Fanula Flanagan if she got that nomination maybe all these doors will open and for those in the know that didn't happen that Oscar nomination and sadly Fanula's never been anywhere closer than that of being Oscar nominated um, yeah. she does have other um, you know Tony nominations and an Emmy award but um, somehow she's kind of avoided this sphere of older grand dams of the silver screen even though she has the presence to really you know fulfill that role beautifully mm. yeah no she, she does it's very exciting and and I think about her and the others often, so it's a perfect fit. Um, and when is that the first time you would have known who Fanula was? Um, I don't think so. I think for me, it was um, the TV series Lost. Um, and although she doesn't appear in it for a long time, her part is very, very important. Sacrifice. Don't you talk to me about sacrifice, Charles. I had to send my son back to the island, knowing full well that... That's my son too, Eloise. And I guess if you haven't seen Lost and wish to watch it at some point, maybe skip forward to uh, 20 or 30 seconds. The important part she plays is that she is the facilitator 
for people to return to the island, um, sort of midway through the series. Um, and as soon as she's on screen, you know that this woman is full of mystery and wisdom and all of this stuff. So she really stuck in my head. So it, it, it very much rings close to what you're saying about how you feel about her and the energy that she gives off on screen. It very much came from her appearance in Lost for me. Um, was was it the others for you? Uh, no, Fanula is someone who I um, had to think about in terms of what the first film was that I saw her in. I had her in this movie called Into the West, which I absolutely loved. And it's a very sort of, you know, sentimental Irish drama. Um, and I don't, I just, I for somehow placed her in this movie, but she's not in it. So that's not true. It probably was a movie called Some Mother's Son, um, which is a Terry George film. He's actually the first film. So people might know Terry George better for things like Hotel Rwanda. Um, but this is a 96 film based around the hunger strikes in the north of Ireland um, and a very, you know, complicated film for a group of, you know, I think I watched it in sixth class in primary school, but I could have, it could, it could have been secondary school, but I w we were young enough. And of course, we were living at a time, you know, where the um, peace process would be talked about in the north of Ireland. And, you know, it, we would have been given all this information on a daily basis. It wasn't foreign to us what was happening on in the country that we lived in. Um, but to watch it articulated through Fanula Flanagan and Helen Mirren as these um, unlikely friends whose sons are in prison, you know, fighting against the British rule in the north and are going on a strike. And they have to make all these decisions about, you know, will we force feed our sons? Are we supporting our sons? What do we think about um, a, a united Ireland? What do we think about the British? It's all very loaded. Our day will come. And what day is that, Annie? The day the Brits go home. The day the bloody Brits go home. That's all you people can think about, isn't it? Well, my life won't change either way. It's a, it was a really str striking movie. And I, like there's bits of it that I will remember forever. I mean, we didn't rewatch it for this, so I've no idea how it holds up. But I assume with Terry George you know, directing, um, that it would be pretty solid. And I can imagine the performances, which also include people like Aidan Gillen and Kieran Hines, would really hold up. And so, yeah, she was really like this presence uh, kind of all the time then in Irish films. So, like, there'd be films like Man About Dog, which was a big hit in Ireland, and, um, of course, The Others. Um, and people just refer to her as if she was just this, like, elderly states person <laughs> of the country. And yeah, so yeah, I've just known her probably since I've got into film. And I think the reason like I'm drawn to her is because I think she epitomizes, you know, a stereotypes of Ireland in many ways um, in terms of literature and, you know, being able to say this beautiful words like in this like the language just like flows out of her if we talk about how she performs, say, James Joyce text. Um, but she's also like incredibly sexy, like and like um, mischievous almost. Like there's something about her that's really playful, and you wouldn't really trust her, but you you know that you'd have a good time, so you'd go along with her anyway. <laughs> okay, well, does I that think make that's a... <laughs> it does? I, and I love it. I think there there is something in those eyes, and and you do you are you want to follow. Fanula, wherever she may go. Yeah, in fact, that makes me think she should be in Sister Act Three. If they make that, she'd be an amazing <laughs> nun. She can take the, she can be the Maggie Smith part. Like spoiler, like I just, some she is someone who I'm like, maybe it's her choice, and I'm sure it is. And she, you know, as of whatever age and has had a great career, she doesn't want to be making films. But I would be like, why are people not like chasing her? not down the street or anything, but just like through her agent in a very polite way. Why are they not chasing her to be in their movies? Um, and there's many, many Irish actors I love. And actually, Fanula probably wouldn't even be in my top five. Um, but <gasps> I love... You can't admit like, that here. 
apologies. Apologies. Like, I absolutely love Fionnuala Flanagan, but when I think of, like, an Irish actor I absolutely wish had more, like Breeze Brennan, who anyone that saw Brooklyn... Um, the film with Sir Sharon and would hopefully regret she plays the woman who owns the shop with Ailish's character. Breach Brennan is an amazing actor that I've thankfully seen on stage quite a bit. Um, I think she's someone that definitely would be on the top of my list. But Fanula is not far off because she's been so close to becoming this like you know, mainstay of this interesting, you know, films being made and yet somehow hasn't really it hasn't ticked. It's like she's not had her moment alongside, like, I'm trying to think of who I would want her to be, like Imelda Staunton or, you know, Leslie Manville or any of these sorts of people. Um, and now you can argue maybe Fanula was never going to do that. But I'd say she has the talent. And if she had the opportunities, who knows? Would um, Do you think Fanula would be a draw... I was going to say a box office draw, but at least into sort of indie cinemas in Ireland, would she be a draw for Irish people to get to go to the cinema? Oh, I think so. I think um, yeah. as much as anyone would be a draw um, of that of that nature, yeah. Um, sure, they, they seem to be throwing Lifetime Achievement Awards at her at all sorts of things, which is <laughs> wonderful. Good. But no, she, when I say National Treasure, I think that is incredibly apt for how people Good. feel about Fanula Flanagan, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Apart from me, obviously, if she's not my top five. <laughs> well, no, she's exactly. <laughs> no, I love her. She's just such an amazing, like, such a striking presence, yeah. Oh, well, I'm delighted that we get to chat about her, um, because she is just that, as you describe. And is there something about, like, in Lost or the Others, like, why she has stuck with you? Mm, it, well, both both Lost and the Others, it is... It is a. She is drenched in mystery, and you want to work out what it is that is going on uh, in this woman's world. Uh, if you just look at pictures of Fanula um, or gifts, and there are some good ones out there, um, th- her eyes are just the most intriguing thing. You you sense that there is a world of intrigue and mystery going on. And to me, that is irresistible. It was irresistible when I watched Lost. I remember watching that episode of Lost and during her sequence, because of what was happening, but because of her too, pretty much being up on my feet with excitement, like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Um, So I could never, I would never forget her. She's always been someone I think about for that reason. So I think she's perfect. And because of that sort of mystery and intrigue, even though perhaps her career in Halloween centric films isn't uh, in the forefront of her filmography, she's so memorable for that reason for me. And therefore I think she's a good fit here. Yeah, I I would totally agree. I mean, I never watched Lost. I don't think I ever watched an episode. And also what you're saying makes sense of what I've been researching around her her um, responses to Lost. She doesn't think it's particularly well written towards the end. And sure. she also writes about, talks about people approaching her with questions about what happened and herself. And she's like, I'm an actor, dear. Like, I have no idea what you're asking me. Um, so yeah, that makes a lot more sense for us. Like, God, make, do people not know what happened? Um, but if it was open-ended or open to interpretation, fantastic. We need more shows like that, let's say. Um, yeah, it, I'm not surprised. I mean, her character is quite literally a gatekeeper in Lost. Like mm. that is who she is playing. A She's gatekeeper. A gatekeep- a gatekeeper. She keeps the gaze in check. Uh, oh, maybe sure I should watch Lost. Enough, this sounds like, <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe, maybe if times were hard, she might have played that in a different type of movie. Um, mm. <laughs> there must be lost title. porn. There must be lost, uh, not lost porn. Porn oh about the God. TV show Lost. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I, I'm starting to feel a bit nauseous. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Um, and on that note, shall we? Shall I even give a little rundown of uh, Fanula's life story? If you would. So Fanula was born on the 10th of December 1941 in Dublin. Um, her mother was a civil servant and her dad did all sorts of, of things, as she describes, um, including acting in a very small part in a film called This Green Ireland, which I could find nothing about, but she... Uh, 
states that in an interview, so I believe it to be true. And then he um, was fighting against Franco in Spain, um, which was a, a lot of Irish um, people went to do that. Um, and then coming back to Ireland would have found it quite hard to settle back in because, you know, the Catholic Church would have been running the country and would not have wanted people to be fighting in that sort of war. And it was a bit of a shame on the family sort of thing. So he he seems to be like a, doing odd jobs and um, an, an interesting man who's very good at telling stories. Um, which is, you know, an appropriate sort of father, perhaps, for a budding actor. Um, and yeah, at a young age, um, she talks about when she was like five or six, writing plays and performing them in her kitchen with her siblings and friends uh, that live nearby. Um, and she also uh, went to an Irish language school. She was speaking Irish fluently um, in school and then would come home and speak in English. Her parents seem to support her interest in acting and she attends classes at the Abbey Theatre, which is Ireland's uh, national theatre. Um, but they really wanted her to have something to fall back on. So one way or the other, she gets a job in a kitchen in Switzerland. Um, and she, there she takes the opportunity to study French and Italian, goes to Italy to work as an interpreter for like two years. Um, seems to have a lovely time. See, I'm romanticizing all this, but I'm sure it was absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Um, and then she returns to Ireland um, as a language teacher. And... Um, is still acting on the side, which leads to a production of On Trial, which is uh, in 1964, is then turned into a radio play on Ireland's national uh, radio station, RT, and then RT, which is also television, and made it into a TV film. And it's, the rest is history from this point for Fanula, and she seems to really explode. Um, and wins a, a Jacobs Award for her performance on TV. Which means nothing for people outside Ireland. I'm not sure it means anything for people in Ireland, but her Wikipedia page <laughs> made it a big point, so I'm going to say okay. she won a Jacobs Award. And you know what? Sure. I wouldn't sniff at it either if Jacob wants to give me one. Um, so, and then there's this kind of bit of a moment. So she's playing um, Gertie McDowell in the film version of Ulysses in 1967. She's at a production at the Gate Theatre in Dublin of Brian Friel's The Lovers, um, or just Lovers. I don't know why I put a the in front of it. Oh. Um, that then goes to Broadway and introduces her to America, which she talks about being so exciting to her um, for all sorts of reasons. And she also meets her husband, who's also from Dublin, but living in or based in um, America, Garrett O'Connor. And she settles in America. And from that point on, she's been consistently working on stage, TV and film. I think a lot of people, like you're saying, will be first introduced to her, her for, will be first introduced to her via TV, particularly American TV. And so like in 1975, she was in The Legend of Lizzie Borden with Elizabeth Montgomery. Um, she is Emmy. Uh, she receives even an Emmy for Rich Man, Poor Man. Um, she's also a lead in How the West Was Won in 1977, gets an Emmy nomination again. Um, people might know her from the Ewok Adventure, the TV film um, in the Star Wars universe. Um, of course, we would be amiss to not mention her uh, appearances in Murder, She Wrote. Um, there's two, I believe, in 93 and one in 95. Star Trek she appears in in 93 and 2002. Lost, as you mentioned, in uh, between 2007 and 2010. And Brotherhood um, from 2006, 2008. Um, you know, she that's just like the tip of the iceberg. Of She's appeared in like Nip Tuck and everything. Like her CV for TV is pretty impressive um, for just being everywhere. And she's also done an awful lot of theatre, which would be no surprise um, from how we described her beginning. Um, recently being in The Ferryman, Jess Butterworth's um, celebrated play on Broadway, where she was oh. Tony nominated, and A Christmas Carol at the Gate Theatre in Dublin. Um, Film-wise, her highlights include James Joyce's Women in 1985, which she produced, starred and co-wrote. Um, P.K. and the Kid in 1987 with uh, Molly Ringwald. Some Other Sons, as I've spoke about it from 96, Waking Ned in 98. And she has this big moment um, in the early noughties with The Others in 2001, which is a, is a big hit, you know, is part of Nicole Kidman's real launch into superstardom as well, alongside Moulin Rouge. And people 
were talking about it, whether or not she was close to an Oscar nomination, I really couldn't gauge. But she does win like the Saturn Award for Supporting Actress, and there is some traction there at least. And it's, that seems to lead to films like Transamerica in 2005 and Yes Man in 2008 um, as a semi-well-known supporting character actor in America. And of course in Ireland, um, in since then she's been, as you guess worded in a correct way, a kind of box office draw. Like I bet she does um, secure a certain amount of funding. So she does appear in um, Irish hits, which some have been successful outside of Ireland and some have just been internal hits, but Man About Dog in 2004, The Guard in 2010, Life's a Breeze with Pat Short in 2013, and Song of the Sea, the animated film in 2014. Um, so like what is like such a rich career really, but also really varied. Like there are, there, there are highs and there are lows in this career. And to to summarize this is one of my favorite Fanula Flanagan projects, but easily probably one of the worst um, is Redwater, the cat and Alfie story. So it's like an EastEnders, the British soap opera spin off where Kat Slater comes to Ireland to try and find her long lost son. And Fanula Flanagan plays their aunt or something. It is it is like a ghostly story. It is in once like I was hypnotized by this thing, um, because the cast was so good, the Irish cast was so good, and you know, I couldn't resist it. It ended with um Kat Slater's character trying to be killed in the water going towards the propeller pe- pro- a propeller? I don't know what I'm saying. Propeller in a boat. And we'd actually there was no second season, so we just assume she well I actually I assume she's probably joined the soap again so so she's probably still alive and not talking about her trip to Ireland and um, but yeah that's the type of work Fanula has also said yes to so not um consistently high quality but she is delivering when she's on screen and next up she has the Hunger Games where she's playing Grandmama um that's how it's written Grandmama and she's also going to be in the home with Cloris Leachman, which at the very least, I hope they have a great scene together. Gosh, I hope so. Wow. So, yeah, that's her in a nutshell. Um, and as mentioned before, she has Tony nominations, an Emmy, um, an IFTA, which is the Irish Film and Television Award, um, Lifetime Achievement um, honour. She has awards being thrown at her in recognition um, in Ireland. So that's really her in a nutshell. And I I think it's probably appropriate that we would end with the low light highlight in terms of Red Water because it reflects like this fearlessness that Fanula seems to have in terms of her career. We will most likely, we will touch upon in a few of the films that we're talking about. Um, but yeah... How how would you like to start, Scott? What film is jumping out at you? Um, well, I think we should take it from the early years where she wasn't only happy to play every character pretty much on screen. Uh, she also had to write and produce. She probably did the score. Um, she probably edited the thing. I don't know, but I'm talking about uh, 1985's James Joyce's Women. Yes, she is certainly, um, you know, like an octopus in this, in that she's well, she's literally <laughs> playing. She's playing six roles on screen, six different roles, while also co-writing it. She isn't directing it, interestingly. And funny enough, uh, did you pick up on the director's name? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which was like, God, I can't believe I didn't even go with that. You share a name, almost. I mean, spelling almost. aside, I think even the pronunciation's probably almost the same, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, Michael Pierce is the director. Sadly, it's not me. I would have absolutely loved to direct Fanula Flanagan in her almost one-woman show about James Joyce's women. Um, but, yeah, she's doing everything. And it's it's uh, adaptation of a play that she also did, um, which seemed to tour for so long. It seems a really celebrated play. A really controversial play, too, because its depiction of sexuality specifically female sexuality um as they are leading the story as well um so james joyce's women is about 
James Joyce is women. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Done. That, that, Done. That is what it's about. It's, story. It's, it's about, you know, the the his wife, Nora, about um, the, the woman who found a distributor and published Ulysses. It's about characters in a story like Molly Bloom. And um, it is fascinating. I mean, I... I am the type of Irish person that would have been brought up in a household that was not so, you know, uh, culturally aware. You know, we would be to a certain point, but the idea of us sitting and listening to a Beckett or going to see James Joyce or Finnegan's Wake or any of these was not something. Like, we did not have a copy of Ulysses at home, I don't think. And I think there's plenty of families like that. So it's almost like, you know, this is, this is you know for nobody like why they like highfalutin sort of stories um and it's only recently with my work in theater and getting to work on you know beckett plays and joyce work um and different really theater makers like Owen ferrari and uh, lisa dwan and um, who are irish theater makers um and just seeing their interpretations it's really made me have this appreciation for this sort of use of language and storytelling and i think what's absolutely beautiful about james joyce's women which is so simple really in terms of what it's really intending to do is that it takes this language of Joyce and it takes this sort of sensibility frames it through his wife but all, like kind of does exactly the same thing in a way it's almost like a snapshot of Joyce there are you know parts where it like flies the film for me I think there's absolutely gorgeous moments in this film it was her he was looking at, and there was meaning in his look. His eyes burned into her as though they would read her very soul. Wonderful eyes they were, superbly expressive. But could you trust them? People were so queer. And then I think there's moments where it's like, okay, you've gone too far. This is very actually, this is, you know, this seems a bit silly. But overall, the effect was hypnotic, which is exactly why I really enjoy reading and listening to the work of certain Irish um, writers who are seen as a bit highfalutin. And like, I only read Ulysses over lockdown and I'd never okay. read it before. Really enjoyed it particularly loved the molly bloom um section at the end so to watch it being performed by such a capable actor is is gorgeous um yeah i i i really liked it i mean my only thing really would be that yeah bits of it are a bit too um theatrical and silly by today's standards but also you know it's such a pain to have six women just obsessed with joyce you know i would have preferred to see a movie about nora doing her own thing you know, um, I, I, they are empowered to a point, but they it is all focused on James Joyce. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, it was a it was certainly an interesting thing to watch. I can't really say that I've seen anything like it before. Um, and it's 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 all about her, though, in terms of you know what's going on on screen. You're right about it being all around Joyce, but it's the Ferula show. Um, and you can see how accomplished that she is here. She's very measured in her approach. You can you can feel her drawing on a lot of classical training. You can sense that you know that just that, like I say, just how accomplished that she is. Um, and it's a huge ask. I know she asked it of herself pretty much, <laughs> but but it, but, it, but it's still an a, a certainly an interesting position to put herself into, because to uh, to assume that the audience is going to be compelled uh, with this source of feature for ninety minutes or thereabout, watching just her, um, it, you know that has to raise a lot of questions. Thankfully, she is incredibly compelling to watch, and it works, and it plays into her strengths and the things that we've described of her. They're used in different ways here, but that you just a mysterious and intriguing presence 
shines through and it allows each of these characters that she is playing to have their own space within the film. Her accent work, to my ear, is pretty good too. Um, it's a really interesting one. Is is this a, a labour of love for her? Are we on the assumption that she must have been a massive like James Joyce scholar, I guess, not even just a, a fan, a, like a scholar, of course, of his. Oh, yeah. she. So she would be associated from, like, so being in the film um, Ulysses as um, as Gertie McDowell, um, yeah, she would have been associated with it and she'd have done plays, you know. Also, I know it's not exactly the same, but Brian Freel, like the, the people she's working with and the sorts of language, it just seems to be something she is interested in and I feel like she's continuing that like recently with the ferryman like Jez Butterworth may not be Irish but certainly that play tends to fall into that sort of remit and that character that she would have played in that um, show would have been resonant to the sort of Irish storytelling that we're talking about so I say it came natural to her and yes she would champion it and the other thing really to bring up about it is it is not a film that really resonated with audiences. Like, it was made, and then it seems to have taken two years for distribution. It wasn't even, like, there's so much sexuality in it, and there was um, certainly, you know, protests and whatever when it was on stage, but on the film it seems really muted, like, just a response to it in general. And this is including two scenes where we see you know, masturbation, like, properly being displayed on screen. Like, they're not shying away from what the characters are doing. Um, But it didn't even in, like, Ireland, I'm sure it caused waves to a certain point, but it wasn't like so many other examples of, like, oh, my God, get this off the screen. This is hideous. Like, A Clockwork Orange or even The Crying Game or any of these sorts of movies that jump out to me of, you know, horror that this is on screen. Um because there is such a repressed place um, and, and not just Ireland, the world. Um, but no, it just seemed really muted. Like I I studied Irish cinema in Ireland, like went through loads of films, like did loads of, you know, work. This film never came up. It is simply mm. because we're doing this podcast that I came across this film. And A, that might <laughs> reflect me and my uh, studious or lack of studious um, <laughs> personality. But I think it's also just an like indication the film is not you know, held up very high, um, which is such a shame. Like, I really wish people would discover or rediscover it. Um, and it's on YouTube for free. So why not? Why not? Because you better things to be doing. I mean, I mean, fair <laughs> enough. Absolutely fair. <laughs> to watch a 90 minute, like, six, <laughs> a person doing six roles um, is interesting. But yeah, I think she's, I think she's exceptional in it. And I was so thrilled to watch it because I was like, yes, Yes, we chose her to talk about her in the podcast. Yes, we get to celebrate her. And yes, now we get to reflect on her other work. Um, exactly. No, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Um, if you want to be a uh, Fanula, not even completist, if you want to kind of get the the best of what she's done, then it's a must. Or if you are a James Joyce um, scholar or it's of great interest to you, then I think it is also uh, worthwhile. Otherwise, it might not be the one for you. Is Joyce uh, someone you're interested in? Like, have you read Ulysses or, like, interested no, in that? No, the extent to my uh, relationship with Joyce is uh, through the work of Kate Bush. <laughs> well, uh, n- you know, that's, the... that's pretty... That's fair enough. And, uh, yeah, but that's, that's great, though, that you enjoyed the film still without having, like, prior knowledge and um, interest in Joyce. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. I'll leave it at the essential world. <laughs> um, well, let's go then to... We're, we're jumping way ahead, but this is where she seems to have started this sort of um, movement to more mainstream thing. Like, she get, gets a Screen Actors Guile nomination, albeit in an ensemble, but it is for Waking Ned. and Or I should say Waking, Waking Ned Divine. Is that just in America it's called that? I don't know, but... Yeah, no, here it's both. also, it's Waking Ned okay. here. I'd wondered if it it meant that it was also an Irish title. I couldn't quite work out, but it's, so it's no. the American title is Waking Ned Divine. Yeah, I don't really, I don't know. I don't know the reasons for that. Um, maybe I should have looked at that before this. Um, but um, yes, Waking Ned is how I would know it. Um, and had you seen it before this podcast? 
No, and I'm sure you probably had um, it being uh, a very Irish tale. Um, so Waking Ned, my first visit with it from 1998 and directed by Kirk Jones, it tells the story of, it's a, I suppose a, a few friends or a couple, so you've got Ian Banning and uh, Fanula uh, as a couple at the sort of heart of the story. Um, and then their friend, uh, played by David Kelly. And uh, as not much is going on in their their older days, they, they take to um, investing a lot in the lottery. Um, and not just talking about money, talking about their time and talking about it. That's where the film kind of opens. And then we find that through some detective work, a.k.a. reading... Uh, the local newspaper that the lottery has been won by someone in the town and then what unfolds is a story of them frantically trying to work out who could possibly be the person who's won and it is so much fun to see uh, Fanula and Ian Banning and David Kelly um, kind of thinking up all of these ideas of how to do it. They'll go to the pub, they'll buy people lots of drinks, they'll get them drunk, they'll ask them, they'll invite them round for dinner. However, they just can't quite work it out. And it turns out that the person who has won it, um, I don't think it's a spoiler six, I'm pretty sure it's in probably the trailer in the plot, they've died. Um, so then they start thinking up how they can possibly make this money their own. Um... It's a film I'd always fancied watching, just because that as a premise is fun. And I remember when this film even came out, I can remember the trailers being on TVs. TVs? <laughs> All of the TVs in my house. The trailers being the two on TVs TV. we had. <laughs> The upstairs I one watched, and the downstairs I one. I watched it multiple times at once. It was on all the TVs. Um, You're crazy. It, what a crazy time. Oh, well, it was on TV, and it was certainly at the at the forefront of many VHS tapes that I think yes, we had yeah. uh, as, when I was a kid. Um, and it was so much fun to watch. I did really enjoy it. I think it sort of does exactly as it intends to. Um so if you watch the trailer and you go, that's for me, it will be for you. Give it a go. Um, it's a lot of fun. And it's a joy to see, I mean, all the, those three actors in particular are having a lot mm -hmm. of fun here. Um, as are James Nesbitt and Susan Lynch, who are also yeah. in the film. Everyone in this is having a lot of fun, but it is so much, there's so much joy in seeing Fanula uh, in sort of um, conniving, uh, meddlesome mode. Uh, trying to also work out this mystery that's in front of them. Uh, yeah. yeah, a joy, a joy. But I assume something that you... Did you come to this film around the time it came out? I must have. Like This is a sort of um, movie I remember watching with my family and enjoying. And I don't know if this is specific to like my group of like... Uh, friends or whatever, particularly like older relations, like in the lotto being like the lotto. And I remember like I've got lovely memories of my granddad talking about what he'd do with the lottery, which was more oh. to do with like, I'd give you money and then I'd give it this and I guess then I'd have this much to give back and all this sort of thing. And so anyway, this this film is kind of tied up in all those things. But I, yeah, I agree with everything you've said. Like it works really well for me. Um love david kelly and i all remember i must have been quite young we laughed and laughed at the sequence where he is um the lotto person comes to like confirm and um, i want to talk to ned divine can i see ned divine and david kelly who had been um swimming um naked in the in the sea as he does with um every day with ian branning banning even um but anyway he needs to get back to ned divine's house super quick so he jumps on his uh, scooter without um putting any clothes on and is you know in the west of ireland or presumably in the west of ireland going off in into <laughs> into ned divine's house naked and it was such a joy to watch as a child and um, we just had so much fun and Fanula, I mean, the one thing I will say about watching it now as an adult is absolutely love Fanula's part in the first half where she's this sort of sure. giddy person that's happy to be in on this sort of romp. I think I know who's won. That's mighty, but I have an idea. I know myself. Annie, what's the noise? It's Michael. And he knows the winner. Well, come on, I want to hear it up here, so. Jeez, Jackie, do you think you're the Pope? 
choking on the bathroom window for the whole village to hear. Oh, come on. Out with it. It's Mrs. Kennedy. Oh, now I've got someone else. Well, speak up, man. Pig Finn. <laughs> Will you look at that? Oh, there's 49 possible winners and we're down to two already. <laughs> She, like, her going to, like, entertain uh, the neighbour they think is going to um, <laughs> uh, going to have the money and then being disappointed afterwards. And then also being the person to discover who it is. Like, she's the one, she's like, I've made all these pies, this many people attended, there's one pie left. But then it quickly turns into her being this sort of, um, you know, the... the um, voice of responsibility and almost representing the antagonist in it saying like you're doing this wrong you shouldn't do this to the men in the film and it's a shame because it does a disservice to her character that we've seen already and also she should like why should a female character always do that like it's such a trope that the wife or the mother will be this person with all the hang-ups where the men can have all the fun so it is a shame she doesn't get to have more fun but she Fanula does an amazing job because she gives enough variation to this character albeit in a, a small part to make it all believable and to still find like lightness in it even when she's telling um her husband basically that you choose money or you choose me um, but yeah, I really like it. And if I was told I had to watch it again in a week's time, I wouldn't mind. Good. Well, I'm glad that it's one that you're happy to revisit and to transport you to happy times. A film which I will say I was um, more reluctant to revisit <laughs> was... I really hope I wrote this title down right. Divi the what? Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood. Bang right. on, that's the that's one. That's it, okay. Yes. Um, which is the 2002 film directed by Kaylee Curry, who people will know writing one of the best scripts ever with Thelma and Louise. Um, she makes her director, directorial debut in a film that I I I did rewatch most of it for this, but I couldn't tell you. Like, I don't know what it is about that movie. It's just like, whoa, it's just like gone out of my head already. And hmm. it's probably a reflection on, you know, the, the London Film Festival has just happened. I've watched a lot of movies. I can't keep up um, with my memory. My memory is going. I can't. There's oh. no more room for movies. Um, oh, no. But you might remember better than me. Oh, well, because I think this is actually a superior film to Thelma and Louise, it very much uh, sits within my mind. Um, that is a joke. Um, but the divine secrets of the Yaya ya sisterhood um, is a film about a playwright played by Sandra Bullock who on the opening um, of her new play is interviewed by uh, a magazine newspaper and she makes some comments about a difficult relationship she has with her mother played by Ellen Burstyn and on her realisation of her daughter saying these things, um, she loses it. She's very, very unhappy. But thankfully for Ellen, she uh, has her Yaya -ya sisterhood, a group of friends from her childhood that blood bonded themselves together in the woods. Um, and those friends, I mean, it's a wonderful thing, are played by Fanula, Maggie Smith and Shirley Knight. So it really is a wonderful thing for that, and maybe that alone. But anyway, thankfully they're there to, to take care of things. They go to get um, Sandra Bullock and bring her back to deal with this situation and to, to make amends so they can stop this fighting that has been going on. And, and during this, we sort of dive into Ellen Burstyn's character's past and understand that, you know, a lot of it's rooted in... Um, mental illness and struggle she had growing up and we see the younger version of her played by Ashley Judd um, and kind of through this better understanding of each other we see them come back together inevitably. I think that makes it sound probably a lot more fun and interesting than it is. Yeah. Because what it's aiming at is like Steel Magnolias or Terms yeah. of Endearment and the way you described it is like yes like it is like so close to being there but when you see the film, it's so far off the mark. And there's so many different reasons of why 
that happens, right? Yes, it's it's too messy. All of those things, although they could have been woven together more coherently, just are not. And it sort of gives you whiplash in terms of where Ellen Burstyn's character is and the Ashley Judd flashbacks. And it's very, very tricky to then stay engaged. But truly, and, and maybe this is coming from... Um, a gay man who is a, a massive Maggie Smith fan, it's easy to find joy in watching mm. those three. And Fanula's really funny and cool yeah. and sort of she's yeah. the edgy one, I yeah. think, with her sunglasses and chewing yeah. gum as she drives the car. Um and and has that steelier edge to her that the others don't in yeah. it. Um and then Shirley Knight is is fun to watch too. It's um it, but yeah, but but that doesn't that doesn't uh, help it. And um, Maggie Smith, as great as she is, certainly does not have a knack for the Southern American accent. But hey, there's there's Camp Joy in watching her try. And Fanula <laughs> doesn't have a good knack for that either. I think the accents, you know, yes. I will complain a lot about you know bad Irish accents. But Lord help me if um, if the accents in that film are bad. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, Fanula has a really like some nice moments. I really love the moment with Ellen Burstein where she like they did it like a car chase on well as close as a car chase as you'll get in a film like this, and then she's like confronts her. Who do you think you're talking to? I know she's there. Now what is going on? Huh? Is betrayal absolutely everywhere? Yes. Your lifelong friends are programming your daughter to destroy you. Well, somebody better tell me what's going on. Vivi, calm down. You're just going to have to trust us. If you go there now, you're going to ruin everybody's life. Um, I have a question. Do you think it would be better if Ridley Scott directed it? <laughs> <laughs> no. Inside joke, because he directed Thelma and Louise, and really Callie Curry really wanted to, is what I've read, and sexism oh, really? and all sorts of things were a part in it. But um, I think Thelma and Louise is perfect as it is, perhaps. Mm, but I would have loved to see him directing um, or improving on a perfect sequence where the the Yaya sisterhood of uh, Maggie, Fanula and Shirley roofie Sandra Bullock to get her on a plane and across the country. I mean, it is obscene. But as I'm saying it, I can imagine people listening being like, well, I have to watch that film. How can I not? Yeah. L- l- preposterous. Yeah, <laughs> there's, so- there's something like... There is joy, but it's also lacking in joy. Like you're watching yeah, it thinking this it should is. be more fun than it is. It is a so it is a shame because you know what a what a fun cast, and I would have loved to have heard to be in like a mainstay in terms of you know the types of older women we see in films like Maggie Smith. Um, but this really is the only time she's in this sort of buddy comedy sort of film with other women, and I would have yeah. loved to have seen her do two more of those. Agreed, agreed. And and also only comparable to um, Gerard Butler's work in P.S. I Love You, here we also have a Scottish man who, who gives the most awful and irritating portrayal of Irish on screen possible, where he's supposed to be an absolute dish, and you're just like, shut up, why? why? And he is just gross, and it's um, Angus McFadden, who's also known for playing uh, Robert the Bruce in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, so take that as you will. I think there's a real, like, um, trope of, like, if you give a man an Irish accent in movies of this sort of time they're automatically like adorable or a romantic interest and I always found it strange because a lot of the time it wasn't Irish men that were playing them and sadly I know all too well (laughs) Irish men are not are not are not the be all and end all (laughs) not myself included not myself included of course um no money joking that Irish men are absolutely wonderful um (laughs) yes but before we get into like the 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 climax of this whole episode and um, with the real horror film in her canon, let's touch upon The Guard, um, which is like... The Guard. A, the Guard is a, the, a murder mystery, so it's kind of Halloween-esque. Um, uh-huh. And it's Brendan Gleeson who plays the titular role of The Guard. It's directed and written by John uh, Michael McDonough. The, um, so it's set in Galway, in the west of Ireland, which 
is very significant because they want this small town sort of feel where someone like Brendan Gleeson, who doesn't play by the book, but plays with his like by his experience and his knowledge of the people um, wins out, really, um, is very much following, you know, kind of old fashioned Westerns tropes um, in a very interesting way and subverts them. And so Don Cheadle arrives from America, inserts, you know, humor about race um i don't want to say humor i mean that inverted commas um um <laughs> because brendan gleason is openly ignorant to race and um americans and all sorts of things he's basically ignorant to everything and i think part of the beauty of the film and how that they present this character is they somehow make that feel much more endearing than that sounds on the face of it um and explain it a bit more and investigate it more than you would get in, say, in some of the criticisms of Three Billboards by um, yeah. John Michael's um, brother, Martin McDonough. Um, anyway, back to the story. There's also Fanula Flanagan, who is playing Brennan Gleeson's mother, who is in a hospice or a nursing home um, with a terminal illness. And... They have really wonderful scenes together. And the film explores this one gang that basically are getting too big for their boots and about what will happen. Like, and different things happen. And it's a bit like a, a bit like a caper, a bit like a Western and a really black comedy. I had seen this in the cinema, really enjoyed it. It was a big hit in Ireland. Um, so much so that this led on to like Calvary, which was made with Brennan Gleeson and, and um, John Michael and McDonough again, uh, reuniting. It's really interesting film. Like I don't, don't, you know, I never claim it to be one of the best films ever made, but I really enjoy it. And I, and I was really happy to sit and watch it again. And I do think Fanula Flanagan is really touching in it. And like we've talked about her being this kind of fierce presence. So to watch her play someone who is embracing, you know, the end of her life is really something. And um, particularly there's moments where she is like wanting to explore more things, including poppers, which is um, really fun. Uh, <laughs> you know, she's talking about different drugs and, uh, and all sorts. I could do with some cocaine. They say it gives you great get up and go. Oh, it packs you up, all right. Helps you get off with the lassies, too. They're mad for the stuff. <laughs> You're a good blame, though. True enough. What about amyl nitrate? What? What about amyl nitrate? What does that do for you? What am I, a fucking drugs aficionado? What's with the interest all of a sudden? I don't know. I feel I've missed out. You missed out on amyl nitrate? Oh, generally, I'm saying. I'm sure we all fucking missed out generally. And she just is, you know, saying that these are the things I should have done. And then he's supporting her in a very sort of believable but beautiful way. Um, and there's a moment where they're in, and it's actually her last scene when they're in a pub and she starts going on about like, you've been the best son, you're always here for me, you're always this. And it's clear like she's very sentimental and she wants to fulfill this sort of notion of, you know, not last rites, but like goodbyes. And he's like, no, 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 don't be doing this. And he's like bringing her down to this sort of dynamic they've always had, or you can tell they've always had. It's a really well-judged um, dynamic the two of them have. And I think it brings a lot to the film because because of her presence or lack of presence, um, Brennan Gleeson's character reacts in a way that's totally believable and totally like motivates the story and yeah so I, I'm I I really love that it exists and I find a lot of the humor very funny so yeah yeah no it's it's a good in it really is and l like you say a lot of that is down to their dynamic and and I think credit to Fanula and Brendan for not just nailing chemistry, but for making it believable from a really deeper level place. And in this case, I think it's a shared sentimentality, as you describe, but also a very shared sense of humour. Um, and you can understand that they would be mother and son for those reasons. They're all so fucking boring. Who? 
that the inmates <laughs> gloomy. I suppose they have a right to be gloomy. Well, there's no need to make such a fucking song and dance about it. Uh, it's very dry. She brings out the best in it. Um, it's it's really interesting, and 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 like you said, the kind of the comparison to the writing of a problematically minded character isn't dissimilar to that of his brother Martin, and they obviously share an interest in the grotesque type character, and and writing someone that you can back even though you sort of disagree with a lot of what they stand for and where they're coming from it is just that in this case this one feels more rounded i think it's i think my criticism of the film is a tricky one and it's almost one i i almost resent as much having it as not as the idea of but some of these gags around race and stuff are placed and are delivered to get laughs and i fully believe that they would have got big big laughs in mm -hmm. cinemas and it's intentional, and it's playing on something intentional, but it is it is just played in a very funny way. So it's it's kind of hard to argue without getting into the terrain of kind of censorship and the value of these things, and and who's mm. it for, and who's laughing, and 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 how is this humor targeted? It's tricky, but to be honest, I think it's still that doesn't matter like i don't think it yeah. matters that doesn't matter and if i was to th say it mattered then i'm basically censoring yeah. being able to ever have portray this kind of humor which is a real thing on screen and he is really yeah. wonderful at it there's a scene in particular where, and it sounds absolutely grotesque but he's pretending to interfere with a corpse um, and pretending to have like clairvoyant uh, senses as he is molesting this corpse, and that sounds really hideous, but it's very very funny, and he plays it very well. Yeah, and I think um, going back to what you were saying about, um, and now I'm putting words in your mouth, but being uncomfortable perhaps with some of the humor because you're like, well, is this, like, is this right to put it in? Like, what? Who is laughing at this, and what is the intention? And the film also is clever enough not to like Don Cheadle is amazing in the film like I regardless of um who else might have been considered for that part like it's terrific and his race really only comes into it with that comment about um, at the start from Brennan Gleeson all the other stuff would have happened regardless like um, in terms of when he goes to um an Irish town and is like knocking on doors and some of the people are speaking Oscalga in Irish and um he he just he just he just doesn't know how to interact with them and the people are being standoffish that would very much happen that's not a race thing that is like imagine a british person going around asking um people in the west of ireland for information on gangs they, it's not it's nothing really to do with with um his race i would say um but maybe that's not clear enough sure. in the film but i and also i don't know because maybe they'd come back and say no actually if it had been Matthew McConaughey, but I think if Matthew McConaughey turned up at the doors of these people, they'd still be like, get away. Um... No, I agree. That's actually a really good point. And in, not in a way that it's sort of tacked on. He is condemned. Whenever we hear these words yeah. or these kind of problematic racial slurs come out of his mouth, he is condemned for them, but in an organic yeah. way, in that the other people around him are being like, you're being, a, you're being an asshole, like, what, you're being an ignorant fool, stop talking yeah. like that. So even if it's landing and getting the laughs from certain audiences, it is still condemned, and therefore within the context of the film in itself, I think it is, it is grand, unlike other films where I find that the intention too mucky to get my yeah, head around. I think that's a good way of wording it. Um, talking about in, uh, mucky intentions, um, shall we talk about Nicole Kidman <laughs> and her curtains in the other? <laughs> <laughs> Please, there's nothing more I would love. Um, I'm a little bit obsessed with the others. Um, I think the others is a fantastic, campy, horror, ghostly film. Um, and it's, for my money, this and Moulin Rouge are like the two big like starry movies Nicole Kidman has ever had and most likely will ever have as a lead. Um, in some ways, it feels like a classic Hollywood story. Um, and she's giving full on campy, you know, shocked face the whole time. Um, 
so the others for those um who have who have not seen it and I really would recommend um it's a two thousand and one film by Alejandro Amenabar um who mm-hmm. people might know for doing Open Your Eyes which was uh, the film that then was the basis for Vanilla Sky um and it follows Nicole Kidman and her two children who are photosensitive so if they ever see light their skin will burn and they'll die so she spends most of her days closing curtains locking doors you know making sure that they're safe and everything and and then one day they wake up and there's no one in the house nowhere in the house my whispering isn't really whispering no no it was beautiful so no one's there and um she's pretty pissed off um anyway knock then there's a, (laughs) a knock on the door and there you have three Irish people, um, Elaine Cassidy, who is a mute, Eric Sykes playing um, a, a, a character name that will just always in my head because of the way Fanula says it, Mr. Tuttle. Mr. Tuttle, your hair. And Fanula, who's kind of the ringleader of this threesome, um, as they, op- they enter the house and all is really not what it seems. Fanula is kind of the, the, is really the way into this uh, suspense, I think. Um, I think from the off, you think they, these three people, particularly Fanula, is up to something. Um, you think that um, Elaine Cassidy's character cannot communicate uh, verbally anymore because something that's happened and perhaps Fanula is behind it. As we get to know Fanula, she does seem gar- less guarded about certain things, got very guarded about other things, um, but she then is able to play this really interesting, mysterious um, kind of juggling act of like both giving Nicole Kidman information, but also causing her more distress. <laughs> oh, Mr. Tuttle, I was just on the point of calling you. Did you know that someone has taken all the curtains? The curtains? Oh dear. Why should anyone want to take all the curtains? Oh, to let some daylight into this house, I imagine. Daylight? Of course. Someone wants to kill my children. Now, why do you think that the daylight would kill them? But that was before the condition could have cleared up by itself. And you really want Fanula Flanagan to succeed in whatever you assume devilish sort of um, thing she's up to. But you also feel like obviously want to protect Nicole Kidman and the kids. So it's a really it's a really well judged performance and a really well cast film because you can all of these characters are sympathetic and you really want them all to to succeed and not succeed at the same time. I was hooked watching it. I didn't write any notes this time because I was so hooked again watching it. And my partner had never seen it before and he was on the edge of his seat. Oh, good. Yay. Oh, that's so fun. I've always loved the others and I have watched it many times. I think for exactly that reason is it is rewarding every time. It is... Uh, One of few horror um, or even horror adjacent films that you would get in cinemas now, which really feels like a classic that has been crafted no matter which year it came out. Um, And that is in thanks to perfectly judged performances and and, and that casting, like you say, across the board. Um, like Nicole Kidman being one of them, for all of those things that you say about being kind of over the top or, or sort of the fakeness, it just plays well into the intention of the film. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's creepy, it's it's fun to watch, it's just a really solid ghost story and one that I think will live on and I think one that rightly deserves a place on anybody's Halloween watch list at the very least. Um, I think it's great and and Fanula in particular is a real part of bringing that unknown to what is at the heart of the others. Um, 
because it's such a fun ride, I wouldn't want to say more than that. But the unknown that's at the heart of it is in great debt to Fanula's character and Fanula's mm-hmm. performance of that mm-hmm. character. Um, so much joy watching this film. I really, really love it. And do you think she should have been Oscar nominated? I would have to look at who else was nominated, but I certainly wouldn't begrudge a nomination at all. I think they both, Nicole as well, I think they both deliver what is required of the brief. They got the brief, basically, and they went, yeah, I can I can nail this. I've got exactly what you need. It's in my arsenal. And perhaps in both cases, it's what comes most naturally to them as performers. Yeah, well, um, the nominees of that year... Um, were Helen Mirren and Maggie Smith in Gosford Park, brilliant. And mm-hmm. um, Marissa Tomei in, in the bedroom, brilliant. Yeah. Kate Winslet in Iris, and Jennifer Connelly in A Beautiful Mind. Now I'd be putting Fanula above the eventual winner, Jennifer Connelly and Kate Winslet. Um, but um, do you know, you yeah. can't have everything. Um, yeah. No, I I would only keep the the Gosford ladies and Marissa. Uh, everyone in the bedroom is wonderful, worth knowing. Yes, yes. Um, and I would also swap out Judy Dench with Nicole Kidman, again, being nominated yeah. twice. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Absolutely del- would be delightful. Although I'm sure if we looked at the longer list of people that were in contention, there would be other people too. But anyway, yes, I, I, would, have, I would love if she had been an Oscar nominee. And I feel like... I just don't know what film she's been cast in that would get Oscar attention. But then I always have to remind myself that, particularly in America and in England, like... Irish stories and Irish films, be it plays um, or, or TV or film, um, seem to have an a easier access of getting an audience than maybe other international films. So perhaps perhaps there is some. Maybe there's a really good part, as, um, as we'll describe when we, we talk about future films for her after the quiz. But yeah, I've been really grateful that we've uh, revisited or for you visited um Fanula Flanagan's work and yeah I w- next time we'll have to have a drink with her and interview her that's how we're going to do the podcast in future yes please we we stumble over her and then we have a chat <laughs> sounds perfect sounds like our night out um <laughs> <laughs> um and again you're quizzing me what a joy woohoo more um Spooky month quiz is coming at you. How are you feeling? Um, titillated? Scared? Ooh, <laughs> perfect. I'm glad you're titillated. I was trying to think of really fancy Joyce language, and I don't believe either of those would have fit the bill, but I <laughs> at least tried. I, it's not a word I use, or yeah, titillated, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'm so glad that you're feeling that way, and I only hope that this quiz... Um, allows you to maintain that feeling throughout. So as it is, um, as we intend this to be a spooky season Halloween uh, episode, I'm going to stick with that theming for this quiz. And this one is going to be called Scream Queens, even though Scream Queens tends to refer to a certain type within a horror film. Normally the protagonist, um, etc., you think of Jamie Lee Curtis, things like that. However, this is more around women in horror films or horror-adjacent films. So so Halloween, spooky, creepy, whatever it might be films. And what's going to happen in this quiz is I'm going to give you a sound clip from a film. And what you're going to do is tell me who the screen queen or the actress in the film is and what the film is. And as a link between these clips, they are all co-stars of Fanula from throughout her filmography. So she has worked with all of these women at some point, but this is them in a horror or horror-adjacent film. Love it. Love it. Fabulous. Okie doke. Well, I hope you still love it when we play. Michael, here is the first clip. So now I can't accept and I can't forgive because because nobody admits anything they've done this is absolutely infuriating because i i have seen this film more than once and i can envisage the actor in that 
scene, most of the film they've had their shit together and then they've just like, they're like tearing themselves apart. And I just, like the people going through my mind, I mean, it's none of those people. It's someone I absolutely love as well. And it's Correct. also the sort of film that I, like it's not Julianne Moore, but it's a certain type of style of uh, woman, uh, not on the verge of a nerve, but on a breakdown. Um, oh, that is so frustrating, and I won't let you tell me. And I, <laughs> I'm... we're gonna be sat here all night. You're gonna. This one is, uh, is a. F- I you will get this one. Of course, if I will. Do on for <laughs> just a moment longer. I'm sure. Okay. Now remember, think horror. Oh, this is a horror movie. Yes, these are all horror movies. Or oh. horror adjacent movies. Okay, well, let me. In my head, this is a rom com. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I need to rethink where I'm approaching oh, this. Oh yes. Um, as soon as you have that in your head. Oh my I god, think... <laughs> I'm being so fucking stupid. I'm so stupid. Oh. Do you know who I was? In? I was in vid- like the person I couldn't get out of my head was Sigourney Weaver, frustrated at work, and somebody had like dumped. And I was like, this isn't a real film. And yet I want to see it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Me too. It is Tony. It is Tony. I've seen not only the film, but this clip countless times. Yes. This clip is amazing. Yeah. Nobody so, accepts uh, anything that they've done. <laughs> and it's Take Tony, that face off your face. Tony, um, uh, Tony who? Colette, sorry. And, and what is Tony Colette in in this uh, clip? Oh, this is um, Hereditary. Absolutely. Tony Clayton, Hereditary. You did get there. I knew you would. Um, you just needed some light reframing. Um, and what have Tony and Fanula done together? Oh, a very good question. It was a film called Birthmarked from 2018. We missed it on both. We had two opportunities to watch this movie and we've missed it. I know. It's absolutely shocking when that happens. But alas, it did. Uh, anyway, on to the next Scream Queen. What are you talking about, for Christ's sakes? Did you see her or not? She's acting like she's fucking out of her mind, psychotic, like a, what, a split personality or Oh my God. I feel like there's certain actors who are just so, um, are just so wonderfully glorious to watch have a freak out and that's Ellen Burstyn or Burstyn I don't know Burstyn Burstyn Mm -hmm. and like I want to say Requiem for a Dream I don't actually or The the Exorcist is Uh, it? I mean yes I I don't know her I don't know her very well and it's the truth Um, I have seen The Exorcist of course but I wouldn't be able to quote that moment from it but um a jolly, a jolly, a jolly, a jolly thing to listen to. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you found it jolly. That is indeed Ellen Burstyn in The Exorcist. And if you didn't get it from our uh, chatting earlier, um, Fanula and Ellen start together in the divine secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood. All right, well done. We are doing well, even if there are moments of uncertainty. But let's move on to the next. Gransboro's finest. Caught cheating. It'll be scandalous. Look, I am innocent. Oh. Oh, how moving. You know I didn't do it. Even the innocent sometimes burn at the stake. Now take your sniveling self and get out of my house. So that is the beautiful voice of Helen Mirren. But who she, who she's telling to get out of her house? I, I, Winchester? I've never seen it. Is that her? It's, it's so it is Helen. It's not yeah. Winchester, but yes, that would be another example of Helen in a horror. This one is more of all of these. It's the most adjacent. It's not so much a horror as kind of a comedy thriller with with horror inflections, shall we say? Uh, the Queen. The Queen is a comedy thriller with horror <laughs> inflections, but it is not that. Well, she's been haunted by a ghost and needs to get her act uh, together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. That's very jokes. true. Um, and the ghost is not Tony Blair. It is Princess Diana. And um, okay, I a ghost story with Helen uh, Helen Hunt. I nearly said Helen Mirren. Um, and now I'd love to see uh, Helen Hunt running around a house being scared of ghosts. That's a film I'd love it's, to see. So this is not um, a ghost story. This oh, film. sorry. Pff, I Fast and Furious. 100 wasn't she in one of those films 
I don't know what I actually I don't have no idea. I'm really bad at A with horror, but B like Helen Helen, Helen Hunt Helen Mirren <laughs> makes a lot of movies and I don't she see them. Does. Red she Two does. Um, Is that a horror film? It, it is to me, but it's not correct either. I reckon <laughs> I reckon you will be a fan of this film. So let me tell you okay. who she is talking to, and then I'm yeah. pretty sure you get it. So the actress that she's uh, dressing down in this scene is Katie Holmes. The, that's not helping. I actually don't know what this is. Mm, I included Bobby? it because it played in our favourite cinema, the Prince Charles Cinema's horror season. Um, okay. It is teaching Mrs. Tingle. No, that... that... <laughs> You may well be speaking a different language. I don't know what that is. Should we go see it in Prince Charles? Oh my god, if we can, absolutely. Teaching Mrs. Tingle is a nostalgic favourite of mine. It is. Well, a there lot we go. Fun. There's my prize if I get um, most of them right. There we go. You are working towards a screening of Teaching Mrs. Tingle, uh, a real joy of a film. Um, but for now, let's see if you can get that screening. Here comes your next. That's one part of the mystery solved. The creatures must need our bodies to survive in sunlight. Like a human suit. SPF 1 million. Is that Linda Cardellini in Scooby-Doo? It sure is. You had no Yay. problem there. Well done. Uh, I have Linda taste. Cardellini. That's what they call that, <laughs> taste. No, and you're quite right. It, it, it takes the highest taste to have seen that classic. Um, starring alongside Fanula in Kill the Irishman from 2011. What a film. Which is what I'm going to do to you <laughs> yeah, for not knowing say. teaching Mrs. Tingle. Um, <laughs> that doesn't make me nervous. <laughs> um, all right, here is your final clip. You know what I'd love for lunch? Fresh asparagus. Then, um, pasta. Angel head pasta with heaps of basil, garlic, olive oil. Yes, Nicole. I can't do the accent. It's oh my no. god! <laughs> no, um, I, I I can't do an Australian accent, but um, that is Nicole in dead cam. I can hear the 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 water um, rolling as she talks about food. Um, yeah, that's that's like just her as a nipper. I mean, what, would she be in her early 20s then? I don't know, but... Lovely. Oh, yeah, I assume so, yeah. But a confident finish. Yes, that was indeed um, Nicole Kidman in <laughs> I started. Camp. I started so rocky. If I do not know Tony Collette and Hereditary, that's oh, a bad start. No, that was a bad start. But at least you finished strong. And, of course, they starred together in the others. Um, well, well done. Let's. If it is not still playing for us to see, then... We are going to have the joy of watching Teaching Mrs. Tingle, and gosh, I hope you enjoy it as much as I do, or did. Maybe I won't so much anymore. Who knows? It's been a while. I literally arrived back from um, having to work in Dublin on the Monday that it's showing. So yeah, let's do it. It's that evening. I'm sure. Let me figure it out if I can make it work, but if I can, I will. That sounds oh wonderful. Perfect. On 35mm, just as God and the team behind it intended. <laughs> <laughs> and sadly, Fanula won't be in that screening. But what what film would you love to see her in on the big screen? So um, I would like to see her do anything and everything. But I'm going to play into the that energy that I enjoy the most from her, which is that real authentic sense of mystery from the moment she is there and I'm transfixed and I want to work her out like the puzzle that she is. So I'm pitching an idea again this time round and what it is going to be is Fanula is playing a grandmother and then we also I'm going to say we have a granddaughter or grandchildren um, as part of this uh, as the kind of co-leads cool and they might live in a small town and we see them having a nice old time, da 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 But then there seems to be a series of deaths occurring, and we can sense that there is something mysterious, of course, about this grandmother. What's going on? The the kids start to suspect, the, is this something to do with Granny? What's she going to tell us? Come on, let's work this out. Um, and as it escalates, maybe we find out that there's a supernatural type edge to it. 
I'm thinking that she was perhaps a witch and there might have been this society of witch hunters trying to track her down and one by one she's chosen to kill them off to maintain her secret. Um, and I think that's a perfect way of, of harnessing that thing that I love the most from her. And I'm going to say that I would like to see this done... When I think of mystery, I think of M. Night Shyamalan, but I'm not going to go down that route. I'm going to actually go down um, the Guillermo del Toro route and yeah. say that he could bring a real elegance and magic to this creepy, creepy tale that I can't wait to see. That is my pitch. That sounds wonderful. And um, and he's such a great fit as a director for that type of story, but for her as an actor as well, like she'd she'd fit in so well. I really hope maybe he really likes the others and would utilize her somehow. Um hmm. mine is much more straightforward and I feel like less creative than my usual ones, but only because I, I hit upon something that was like, okay, this is something I'd love to see. So Mark McDonough, as well as being a celebrated filmmaker, is a very celebrated playwright. And one of his plays, Beauty Queen of Lenan, I think could work really well as a film. And it's really a story about a mother and a daughter, um, a daughter who is this 40-year-old spinster who's living with their mother, who is purposefully holding them back in life. And it is the mother, the character of Mag, that I would love um Fanula to play. Um, stupidly, I've not thought of who I'd want to play the 40-year-old woman um, or the daughter. And my mind has gone a bit blank. All the people I'm thinking of are either too young or too old. Um, like Anne-Marie Duff. Anne-Marie Duff is someone I think is amazingly talented and deserves to be doing a whole lot more and actually would be fantastic. That's I don't know amazing. what age um, Anne-Marie Duff is, so maybe she's playing, skewing a bit... Um, too old or maybe too young, I don't know, but let's make it work. Anne-Marie Duff and Fanula Flanagan in a screen version of the Beauty Queen of Lenan, and I would want Martin McDonough to, to direct it because, or his brother if he wants to, John uh, Michael, um, because it's very, like we were talking about before, like it's clearly coming from someone with a sense of the grotesque and this sort of you know, ha matching violence with humour, with um, heart, with hatred. It's a real interesting mix of things, which I think they do, to my mind, well, mo mo most often, more often than not. Um, but yes, I'd love to see that. It's a, it's a real, tr it's a tragedy in many ways. This, I saw this with my mother and my sister in, in London and... Let's say it wasn't a trip, um, or it wasn't the type of show to see on a on a weekend away. It was it's very, <laughs> it has a lot of questions, but it was really good. It was absolutely brilliant. Good. Sort of the Young Vic Theatre. Um, so yeah, I that would be my choice. Love it. Well, that's a great one, and and using other unsung heroes that we would love to champion. So tick tick tick. Well done. And actually, speaking of unsung heroes, the actor I saw in um, London at the Young Vic is a. Uh, Irish actor called Rosaline Linehan, who's fantastic and a very celebrated stage actor, who again, I would have loved to have seen more on screen. Um, but yes, okay, that is that is it. I'm not going to stop just picking out Irish or kind of <laughs> semi, because I feel like Anne-Marie Duff isn't Irish, but she may as well be um, with How a lot of the work you? that she She's does. How fucking dare you? She's ours, you dead. Yeah, no, she, I think she prefer to be uh, an Irish <laughs> No, I've no proof for any of this. Um, but yes, I would just love to see all these people um, do more. And yeah, so thank you everybody for joining us as usual, or for the first time, depending on what you've been doing. And uh, where can people continue to find us or refind us? I don't. I'm just losing the ability to speak. Where can people find us on social media, Scott? Let's just well, go with please, the easy one. Well, yes, and and please do come and find us. Uh, you can. Grab us on Twitter and Instagram at don't know her underscore pod or drop us an email if you wish. Uh, and you can do that on don't know her pod at gmail.com. Please do come and uh, let us know what you'd like us to chat about next. Uh, or if you have any particular disagreements with anything um, 
that we have spoken about in this episode. We we love to be challenged lightly and delicately. Um, yeah, so please come in, come in, challenge us all you wish. Come at us, come on. And, and yeah, and please do, as we always ask, rate, review us wherever you can. Um, and also share on if there's one person you think would enjoy listening to us rattle on and have a laugh um, and also celebrate um, some of these actors please do share um, but yes that's it thank you all thank you scott and i hope you have a great day thank you so much i hope you two have a great day you two the band <laughs> <laughs> i hope you two especially bono and the edge have wonderful days and i hope that, a beautiful you know... day as they would say <laughs> You actually look like Bono today. I know the audience oh, can't see you, oh, but you oh, have oh, a oh, certain oh, oh, Bono edge to you. Ha <laughs> God, it gets funnier and funnier. I know. You need to stop. Um, also, Irish people do not like you 2 or Bono most of the time, I would say. Um, anyway, now we've said goodbye. We've continued. And now we're saying goodbye. Um, no mention of any Irish bands. Say la vie. Goodbye. Goodbye.